When you think about countries, some of them you can describe almost with one word. Take, for instance, Germany. When I hear Germany, I think efficiency. Japan, technological. Britain, heritage. Italy, flamboyant. America, large. Mm. But Sweden, what word would you associate with Sweden? Well, I tend to associate it with the word cool. And that's not from the point of view of temperature, that's from the point of view of the sort of like the products and the design language that comes out of the country. Whether or not that's a piece of furniture from Ikea or whether it's a, a piece of clothing from Falhalraven, there's just something cool and sort of like crisp about Swedish design. It's as cool as a Scandi noir drama because when it comes to design language and embracing everything that Sweden stands for, there can be no doubt that Polestar have got it off to an absolute art and that is very much evident in their latest offering. Welcome to this week's edition of Sneak Peeks, welcome to the new Polestar 4 and as always, welcome to Auto EV. <laughs> Now, before we get started with this week's edition of Sneak Peaks, it is of course that time where I'm going to ask you to make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Then once you've done that, make sure you've pressed the little bell button down below because then that way you'll get a notification of when our next video is uploaded and it's gone live. Once you've watched it, if you do enjoy it, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And of course, don't forget, leave me your thoughts and comments down below. Let me know what your thoughts are on the cars that we review, such as the new Polestar 4, and of course on the Auto EV channel as a whole. Now let's clear one thing up before we get started. I know that Polestar are owned by a Chinese company called Geely Holdings and yes they have a manufacturing facility over in China but trust me when I say this, Polestar are as Swedish as ABBA sitting there in an Ikea store eating a plate of meatballs. They started off life obviously as the performance arm of Volvo and their first car that they produced as a standalone brand was of course the phenomenally beautiful Polestar 1, which was a large exotic coupe. But it was the Polestar 2, the car that they've sort of like really sort of like become, become synonymous with, where they set their stall out as a fully electric car brand. And it's had huge success. But Polestar knows that in order to move on and grow, you can't just rely on one product. And so far, we've seen what the future of Polestar looks like. Of course, we've already had a sneak peek of the new Polestar 3, its premium SUV, which oddly enough sits above the Polestar 4. There's also going to be the Polestar 5, which is going to be spun from the Precept concept, and the Polestar 6, which we've already seen as the O2 Roadster concept. But the Polestar 4 is probably going to be one of their most, probably is going to go into probably one of the most fiercely competitive market spaces of them all, the D-segment SUV. Now the D-segment SUV coupe sector has cars in it such as the Kia EV6, the Audi Q4 e-tron Sportback, Ford Mustang Mach-E GT and cars such as this. But Polestar are at pains to point out that the 4 stands apart from them and it's a little bit more premium. Is it? Time to take a deeper dive and find out. Now in the beginning, as I say, there was the Polestar 1, where it shared a lot of commonality, as I say, with the parent company Volvo, it's adopted, Polestar's adopted parent. But as we've moved forward through the years, we've seen them kind of move out from underneath Volvo's wings and start to develop their own style. There's an element obviously with the Polestar 2 where we saw um, a lot of sort of like Volvo commonality and you could see the relationship there. But as I say, with the three that came out last year, they started to move apart. Of course, with the concept cars, they really started to move apart and set out their own design language. Now, the Polestar 4 takes a lot of cues, if you like, from the Polestar 5, as we saw the precept concept, one of which is this, no rear window whatsoever. Now, I normally get upset when there isn't a rear wiper on a car, so how am I gonna feel about the fact that there isn't a rear window on it? Well, there's a very good reason that there's not a rear window on this car, and that's going to come a little bit later when we move into the interior of the car. So I'll leave that for them. Now, I normally start these design briefs by looking at the front of the car and moving around, but I'm going to start at the back because, as I say, that's probably the most controversial, perhaps, aspect of the new Polestar 4. But we can see the familiar Polestar styling cues. 
you've got this really beautifully integrated light bar that runs right across the back. Now we saw that again, as I say, with things like the Polestar 2, but it's now much more stylized, much more sort of like thin and much more sort of like Polestar's design language. Of course, you've got the Polestar logo at the back here, which is always finished in the matte body color. And at the back, instead of um, a rear window, you do have cameras mounted up there. They're very quite neatly integrated, probably where you'd expect to find like a kind of shark fin aerial on a normal car. And that's going to give you your rear view, which is much better than you think that it could be. Of course, at the bottom, you've got this, this the contrasting sort of um, black um, finish down here, um, which seems to just sort of like take away the visual bulk of the rear of the car. This can be optioned up in body colour if you want, but personally I think it looks great like this. And then of course you get another little camera down in there to help with your reversing. There's some really nice little bits of aero around the car as well. These little bits here that just help with airflow and distribution as well. And as I say, this, as I say this real kind of nice stylized light bar design. It is a lift back, it is a hatchback design. It's not a booted car. You've got this bit, this opens up into a big boot space. But yeah, how are you going to feel about something that doesn't have a rear window? Plenty of van drivers don't have rear windows, but cars? Let's take a look around the rest of it and see what we think. Now, it is actually quite a long car. It's just under five metres long, but that's not the important statistic. The important measurement is the wheelbase, which is just shy of three metres long, because that means they've maximised interior space with the car. You can see there's very minimal front and rear overhangs in the car, and it's obviously quite a low kind of sleek profile. So it looks a little bit more compact than it probably actually is in terms of its physicality. But as I say, that's designed to maximise interior space. Now, we're going to talk a lot about things like premium and luxury. These are words you're going to hear an awful lot when we're talking about this car. And one of the most luxurious things I think you can have is space. And that's something that the Polestar 4 has in absolute spades. Right, interesting little bits of um, design to talk about. In flush door handles, obviously, that pop out when you sort of like open the car. As I say, like the back, you've got this black section down here that just kind of pinches the bodywork kind of a little bit to make it seem quite kind of low and sleek. Um, it's gloss black right down at the bottom as well, which is quite interesting. Now, as I say, you can have that body colour, but personally, I think that's going to just add to the kind of visual kind of size of the car. I think it's best like that. 20 inch alloy wheels are going to be standard on the car with the option of 21 inch alloy wheels. Now we'll talk about trims and stuff later on. This car's fitted with the optional performance pack, so that goes up to 22 inch alloy wheels. And of course, you get your usual kind of Polestar cues with the sort of like the gold brake calipers and the gold um, uh, dust cap valves as well. So a nice little kind of tie in with the other stuff that Polestar do. The other thing that I quite like about it is, well, again, they've got these kind of almost kind of frameless mirrors where the glass comes right out to the edge and they are just neatly into integrated into this front quarter light. Again, a nice clean, unfussy glass house, but not like the Polestar 2, where you've got that kind of visor graphic. There's that real kind of definitive sort of like um, A pillar that sweeps up over into the back, into the rear lift back. As we come down to the front, you can see really strong, clean lines that come into the front of the car, which almost embodies Polestar's new face, which we'll see at the front. And there's quite a lot of tech on the car as well. So you've actually got two cameras which are mounted on the mirrors here to help with the 360 parking arrangement and also um, proximity uh, as well, which it will use as well as a camera there as well. But yeah, handsome looking car in profile, not dissimilar in some respects to the way that maybe a Jaguar I-Pace looks where it can't really be pigeonholed into that particular sector. I think for a, a D-segment SUV, as Polst SUV Coupe as Polestar are saying, it's quite sleek, it looks quite compact and I think it looks really dynamic. Now it's at the front where we see Polestar's new design language really, really move on from where it started with the Polestar 1 and the Polestar 2 and really sort of like develop into its own. Those original Thor Hammer headlights that it's sort of shared with its kind of Volvo cousins, you can now see have developed as they've moved apart into these kind of twin blade design. It's the one unit underneath here, rather than having loads of little lamps here and a DRL up here, they've kept it all nice and compact in one unit with a piece of bodywork just kind of speeding through there and coming round into the front. 
One thing that's a really interesting um, element to this car and its design, I think, is how low the nose sits. It's not a tall uh, frontal area to the car. And obviously EV architecture means that you can do that. Now this is um, underpinned by Vol uh, Gilly's SEA um, EV architecture, which allows the design, uh, designers to have much more free reign. It's not spun from a combustion engine platform, did I suggest, like something like the Polestar 2 was. This is a unique EV platform and it allows a much more freer rain for the designers. It's a really sleek nose, it's almost sports car like that you can see at the front and I say if you look at something like the Polestar 6, the old two roadster concept that we saw that's coming out, you can really see a kind of family face developing here. One thing that I really do like is the Polestar badge, again like at the rear it's this matte body colour finish and it is illuminated but rather than illuminate the badge itself it's the outline that's illuminated and it gives a much more premium feel to the badge rather than dare I suggest something a little bit tacky like the star on a Christmas tree shining through, it just gives a little bit more luxury to the, to the badge of the car. You've also got camera at the front here as well, which will help. You've got some beautiful lines that kind of sweep down through here that almost kind of then frame the front nose of the car. And then down at the bottom, we've got some cooling and obviously some, some sensors in for your front mounted radar. And then there's a nice little flash of chrome through there. Round at the side there, you've also got the aerodynamics with the vents there, which are obviously functional. They take the airflow around the big wheels and down the side of the car. So, styling, what do we think? Okay, well, the controversial part of it's obviously going to be the lack of that rear window. But there's no doubt in my mind, in a lot of ways, this is Polestar's best production car effort yet. I think this thing looks stunning. And as I say, I made a reference earlier to the Jaguar I-Pace, and I do mean that, because if you're a regular viewer of Auto EV, you'll know how much I hold that car in such high esteem because of its design. I think this is up there with it. I think this is a stunning looking car. But of course, that's my opinion. What's yours? As always, let me know in the comments down below. So as you can see, it's a five door lift back, if you like. And the, the actual tailgate itself, as you can see, is fully lined, which is quite nice because you get the little Polestar star embedded up in there, I like that. A hugely practical car, 536 litres, with 31 litres of that as under floor storage. You've got a variable height boot floor. You've also got a standard 60-40 split rear seat as well, and that will take the total capacity up to 1,536 litres. Now, you've got a parcel shelf here, effectively, it's part to sort of like the rear bulkhead if you like because the same there's no rear window but that can be removed as well so if you do need the longer loads through that comes out stores underneath the boot floor and then you've got the total uh, load space all the way through to the backs of the front seats now here in the back of the Polestar 4 there's three quite important things to discuss the first of which is space and that's also going to include explaining why Polestar design team have done away with the rear window the Polestar 4 is a coupe SUV, not unlike something like a Volkswagen ID5 or an Audi Q4 um, Sportback. But the problem with those is they're spun from full-size SUVs. In other words, the structure is already in place for those bigger cars. Whereas the Polestar 4 is a clean sheet design. In other words, they didn't have to stick to any hard points from a car that it's derived from. So they were allowed to be a bit more kind of free with their thinking. And part of their thinking is, Part of this, like the reason, if you like, is the second thing I'm going to discuss as well, which is also luxury. Luxury, I think, in terms of what it now stands for, can also mean space inside. And by having a huge amount of space in the back of the car, makes it feel very, very luxurious. Now, there's a standard fit glass panoramic sunroof, which can go clear or opaque at the touch of a button on the dashboard. And that floods the cabin in with light. But if I sit here, if you can see, that structure is behind my head, so actually there's nothing here. On a normal car with a panoramic sunroof, it's normally starting about here. Whereas if I look up, I can see through that glass panel. It just feels very light, very spacious and very luxurious. There's also a really clever use of ambient lighting around the car, which you can see around here. And that also shines through in the back. There's an, an auxiliary light in the rear there, just behind the seat, that shines up as well. So it, it's sort of like it floods the cabin with this real soft light and it makes it feel really luxurious. 
The second thing that I want to talk about while I'm back here is the use of materials. Now, we know um, Polestar are very sort of like forward thinking when it comes to the environment and that the way that they're pushing forward in terms of the way that they build cars and the materials that they use. One of the things that really impresses me here is this tailored knit textile. Now, this is something that's been developed between Polestar and the Swedish uh, College of Textiles. And it's, it's essentially what it's, they've done at design is to make it just fit. In other words, there's no wastage, there's no off cuts, so it's reducing the amount of, sort of like materials that they're actually using in the car. The second thing to point out as well is the backs of the sort of like the front seat. So whilst this looks like leather, it is actually a vinyl. Now vinyl is normally spun from oil-based plastics, but Polestar have dug down deeper into that, and this is also is actually made from pine oil. So again, it's looking at the actual finite resources and thinking about how they can use them in a really different way or how they can make them in a really different way for the, to reduce the overall impact of the car's production on the planet. And I think that has to be commended. It's one of the reasons why that we gave Polestar an Innovation Award back in 2023, or the Auto EV Awards. The other thing that I also want to discuss while I'm back here as well, apart from the huge amount of space, because I say it's a bespoke platform, so therefore it's a completely flat floor, and as you can see, there is loads of lounging space, and you can actually as well sort of like recline the backs of these seats as well, so you can actually sort of like have them going up and down, depending on the backrest going up and down, depending on how you want them. But the other thing I want to talk about is this mono material. Now the carpets down here are mono material and some of the trim around here is this mono material. And what this means is that a lot of the componentry, the base componentry of the car, again, is made from the same type of materials. So therefore recycling them becomes much, much easier. You don't have to separate the two materials to have two different ways of recycling or dare I suggest even one that can't be recycled when the whole thing is made from the same thing and most of the componentry, the back um, of the components around the car are made from one material, it's a lot easier to recycle it. And as I say, that's one of the reasons why I think Polestar are very much at the forefront of looking at how we build cars, not just making electric cars and saying they're good for the planet, but building them in a way that says they really are good for the planet. Now, let's turn our attention to a little bit more practicality um, things. What have we got? Well, of course, there's enough room for three people across the back here, although the, the rear outer seats are more kind of shaped for the two, there's no doubt you get somebody in the middle here. Um, Isofix points, nice and easy to get to, they're just under these plastic covers. Now, there is a fold-down armrest here, if you do just have the two people, which is quite nice because you've got the little kind of storage tray there and of course your obligatory cup holders in the back. You've also got nets in the backs of the front seats obviously um, for putting your maps in and of course you've got rear climate controls which are done off this touch screen here and two USB-C charging ports down there. Um, there's also, as you can see here, on the side of this armrest is the actual buttons for reclining um, and adjusting the rear backrest so that needs to be down for them to do that but as I say there's plenty of space but more than that not only is there a feeling of thought gone into this car not only a feeling of sort of like a you know real sort of like sustainability gone into it as I say I think this really is the new face of luxury now again like the design of the exterior the interior is sort of like a, a move on from what we've seen from Polestar so far now you're going to see a little bit more that comes out with the Polestar 3. Um, the main focus is the large central infotainment screen um, where all the car's controls are really embedded into so there isn't any physical buttons within the car itself save for the column stocks the window switches and the play and pause button and volume for the media down in the center console so everything is controlled through here but much like uh, we've seen with Polestar products so far it's a Google based Android system it also features wireless Apple CarPlay as standard um, but this controls everything as I say you so your navigation is done by Google Maps and of course you've got your Google Assistant which is one of the best uh, voice activated systems I think you can use the main focus, as I say, about this car, or the main thing I think people are going to be really concerned about, is that lack of rear window. So in terms of the safety aspect of it, when you turn around, you don't see anything. You just see your rear passengers. However, what you do have is this beautifully high-definition rear-view mirror, which uses the image from the camera that sits on the rear hatch itself.
You've also then got a lower camera as well for parking. So when you go into reverse or when you touch the camera button here, you basically have three views. You've got the view that you get in the mirror at the top here of the, from the top camera. You then get the lower view from the lower camera, which is mounted just above the number plate. And then you get the 360 degree view camera view here, which uses the cameras around the car. So the visibility you get from all of these cameras is phenomenal and way better than you'd get by just doing that. So I have to admit, I mean, it's going to take a drive in the car to get used to it, I think, but I have to say, I am quite impressed with it on first acquaintance. Okay, what else do we have here? Well, as I say, everything's sort of like done through this screen. And what's nice about it is this, the things aren't kind of buried within menus, within menus, within menus. You've also got your standard climate control system, which is always on down along the bottom. You've got easy access to things like the Google Assistant just there, and then obviously on the steering wheel as well. Um, your map, as I say, is constantly there, and you can just pinpoint it on there, and it will allow you to make directions, or you can search for it. Or, as I say, you can use the Google Assistant by asking it to, to find a destination for you. To go into your actual car settings itself, you just bring up all these tiles. And again, it's a little bit like a smartphone. You've got all the tiles here that you can go into to set various things up, such as, you know, the car status, uh, your settings. You know, so like if you go into settings, you know, where you want things to particularly be or how you want, the, you know, things set up for you. You also have a standard dash cam with the vehicle as well, and that's on there as well. So the cameras are really all around the car. Um, if you want to turn something off, again, it's just nice and easy. You just press the little car icon and you've got then a sub menu down the side that allows you to go into where you want. So to adjust things for your seats, your ambient lighting, which I'll talk about in a second, um, or to change your driver assistance modes. So if you want the blind spot monitoring on or off, the lane keep assist on or off, you just press the assist mode and then you just flick it on or off. It really is just a two-stage process, so it's pretty good and pretty fast. And then it's response time. It's not perfect, it's not ideal as just having a button like you do get in some cars where you can just kind of turn it off, but it's that sort of minimalist sort of design um, that Polestar are going for, which we've seen obviously with likes of Tesla before as well, and um, with things in the screen. What I will say in terms of the screen, the difference to something like the Tesla Model 3, which has a very good system in fairness, it's a bit bigger. You can really see things. Then, as I say, in terms of how it moves and how it changes, it does seem to be a bit sharper in its response. And I think that is down to the fact that they team up with somebody like Google to develop that sort of technology and don't do it themselves. Right, I'll move on from that. Um, the seats, the seats are fantastic. Oh, I didn't mention the ambient lighting. Sorry, that's what I was going to talk about. The fun thing about this ambient lighting thing is, when you go into it, um, where you want to change it. Now, if I can remember exactly where it is, which is doubtful. Here we go, ambience. Instead of having just like an RGB kind of colour palette, they've done it as the planets. So if you want blue, you choose Earth. You go to Mars and it goes red. You go to Jupiter and it's a kind of nice kind of, kind of purpley kind of lavender thing. Saturn, it all goes a bit kind of yellowy and white. I think that's really quirky. And of course, what they've also done is they've given you all the facts of the planets there. It's average temperature, it's day length and how big it is. I think it's a little bit of fun and I do like it. And I think the most fun will be when your kids choose Uranus. Anyway, let me move on from that. Uh, driving position, excellent, as you'd expect. Seats are superb. And again, it's that sort of like textile knit, that tailored textile knit that we saw in the back. As I say, that it grips you, it just holds you in place. The relationship you have as a driver with all sort of like, you know, the controls around you is superb. In front of you sits a separate 10.2 inch driver information display, which again just gives you the right amount of information. So your speed, your state of charge, your range, and, and obviously your gear indication display as well. So again, just enough. Of course, we're starting to see safety systems creep in. So you've got your driver monitor sensor there. Your transmission stock is on your right hand side. And of course, you've got your indicators and your wipers on the left on this left hand drive one. The steering wheel is exactly as you expect from Polestar. Again, that very kind of minimalist look with the actual positive uh, buttons, the positive touch buttons down the side of it for various different controls. Storage is excellent. Um, you've got this high kind of console that you get in the Polestar 2 um, that holds the two cup holders and the wireless charging pad. But rather than being a solid tunnel, you can see, see underneath here, you've got the storage area there. Plus, of course, you've got more storage there with USB-C ports down in there. And those cup holders can be covered up as well. 
It's the materials, as I say, going back to that, that really uh, impressed me in this car. And as I say, the way that they've done the lighting, the way that it shines through the material and, and from behind it, just puts this kind of soft glow around the cabin. It makes it feel really luxurious and welcoming. And I think Polestar have really moved the game on in terms of what luxury and what premium feel is all about. And I think this is another exceptional cabin from the company. Now the car is going to be available with either a single or a dual motor drivetrain option which we'll discuss in the performance and handling section but it comes with one battery size. Now that battery size is a 100 kilowatt hour battery that's its gross capacity so it's 94 kilowatt hours as a usable capacity. Now in the single motor car which is obviously the longest range of the two that should give a potential of up to 379 miles on the WLTP cycle. On the dual motor car, the more performance orientated car, that figure drops to around about 360 miles. And given the fact that we know that Polestar cars so far have been quite efficient for us, we anticipate, and of course very aerodynamic, especially the new design language, we anticipate those mileages being relatively achievable if possible. Now in terms of charging speeds, both cars will charge up to 200 kilowatts, so that will give you a normal benchmark of 10 to 80 percent charge in around about 30 minutes at its maximum charging speed. The car also comes with an 11 kilowatt onboard charger as standard, but for launch in the UK, and the first initial cars will come with the plus pack option pack fitted, which also includes a 22 kilowatt onboard charger fitted as standard. Now, like I said, the Polestar 4 is going to come with two drivetrain options, either a single motor car, which obviously is rear wheel drive, which has 298 brake horsepower. Now, that should give a 0 to 60 time of around about 6.9 seconds. Alternatively, you can have the dual motor car, which is Polestar's most powerful production car so far at 536 brake horsepower. And that slices the 0 to 60 time down to under four seconds at about 3.8 seconds. The dual motor car is the only one where you're going to have the option of the performance pack as well. Now the performance pack will come not only with these 22 inch alloy wheels but some bespoke 22 inch Pirelli P0 tyres, the Polestar chassis dynamics being enhanced and of course some new Brembo braking systems. Now of course we're going to have to wait till we drive the car until we can actually tell you what the actual handling is like but given how good that they've done with the car so far, especially those BST versions of the Polestar 2, I think this is going to be a real class winner. Now in terms of pricing for the car, you're going to be looking at starting at £59,990 for the single motor vehicle and £66,990 for the dual motor car. Now both of these cars initially in the UK will be offered with the plus pack as standard, but as I said, it's only the dual motor car where you'll be able to get the performance pack as an option as well. But in fairness, the cars are very, very well equipped as standard, not only with the safety kit and the equipment, but also, as I say, that real lovely interior and, as I say, the standard fit panoramic glass sunroof. Now, in terms of competition for the car, Polestar see it being very much at the premium end of the spectrum. So, of course, you're going to be looking at things like, say, the Tesla Model Y performance, maybe even BMW's iX3, and, of course, the just announced Porsche Macan, which has gone EV only for the first time. But I also think that you might also consider some other cars as well that Polestar might not be, I don't know, they might not see them as direct competitors, but in terms of the price point and the performance available, I think you could consider them as well. And those are going to be things such as the Kia EV6 GT and perhaps even the Ford Mustang Mach-E GT, both two very performance orientated D-segment coupe SUVs. Maybe things like the Audi Q4 e-tron, the Volkswagen ID5 and the Skoda Enyaq, even in their more kind of like performance orientated versions, they're not going to be quite at the level of performance of this car. So in terms of those, I don't think they are a, a, a fair comparison. But the other car that you might consider, which is about to go out of production soon, of course, is the Jaguar I-Pace, because it's a very, very similar stylish, compact, D-segment, premium badged SUV. So that could be worthy of consideration as well. It's another excellent design, piece of design from Polestar. Uh, there's no question about that. How it drives, obviously, is going to have to wait until we can do a full auto EV road test. But what's really impressive about this car on its first acquaintance here is not only just the new sort of design language really coming out now so we can see where Polestar are moving towards in the future with the cars that are yet to come out, but also as well their commitment 
to those environmental issues that we've spoken about, the use of sustainable materials, the reduction of overall CO2s and the production of the cars. The Polestar 2 does very, very well. It's something like 21 CO2Es. This is under 20. They've reduced the actual CO2E of this car in the build, and that's only going to get better. So the message from them is this. It's not just good-looking cars. It's not just cars that are great to drive. It's not just cars that are going to fit well within people's lifestyles. But it's also going to be cars that we're going to want to drive because of how they're built. And I think that's a real commendable trait from Polestar. Thank you for watching yet another edition of Sneak Peeks from Auto EV. As always, please make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Then once you've done that, press the little bell button down below because then that way you'll receive a notification when our next video is uploaded and it's gone live. If you have enjoyed this episode, please make sure you give it a thumbs up and don't forget, leave me your thoughts in the comment section down below. What do you think of the new Polestar 4? Is it something that would tempt you away from a Tesla Model Y or a, a Kia EV6 GT or maybe even a Genesis GV60? Do you have a Polestar at the moment? Why did you buy it? Let us know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. Now, don't forget, we're across all social media as well. So Facebook, X, whatever it's called these days, Instagram, TikTok, even if you're down with the kids like we are not, and of course, LinkedIn. So please give us a follow there because every little bit helps. And maybe this is your first time that you've tuned into AutoV and you're wondering what we're about. Well, stick on the channel because there are just loads of videos, not just sneak peeks of new cars coming out, but full road test reviews, twin tests, electric icon CD, there's some motorbike reviews from Charlie Berman, and of course our electric van reviews as well. All that remains for me to say is thank you once again for watching, thank you for supporting the channel, I'll see you again next time.